if we are mandating as Congress for you to do more and don't provide the money, how are you going to expand the, that visa security program? Thank you for the question. The uh, funding that we were providing in FY15 uh, also was accompanied by an, author, an ability to carry some of that money over into FY16. And so we have been very judiciously using the money and reapportioning the money around the globe to, to cover off on the larger threats as we see them developing. And so we are able to use some of the money that Congress gave us in 15 in 16 for that expansion and to uh, continue the expansion of VSP and the enhancements of the Patriot screening and vetting process uh, as we move forward. Um, obviously, we are always able to do more with more. Um, and so if, uh, in, for future appropriations, uh, we are always looking for the way to expand uh, the VSP program. But uh, for now, we are fine for uh, 15 and 16 um, as we move forward. Because you are able to use prior year's funding to support present year's mission. Yes, sir. And that was an important enhancement that uh, Congress gave us last year was to be able to carry over that, that funding. Uh, General Taylor, uh, following uh, uh, that line of questioning with respect to the platforms for social media and other things uh, that there's interest on this committee, uh, have we identified the resources to complete the uh, those projects related uh, to establishing the new platforms on social media? Sir, that is a part of our charter to uh, develop a, uh, an investment strategy around uh, that capability. This committee has been very supportive of uh, certainly INA's efforts at uh, uh, using uh, data within DHS. Uh, those, uh, that funding has been very useful for us in moving that forward, but we don't know yet what the exact amount will be. And once we have that uh, completed, we'll get it through the process and get it back up to the Hill. Well, can you kind of talk to us a little bit about uh, whether or not you've identified the personnel necessary to carry out that mission? Or are we going to have to depend on outside contractors to complete that mission? You know, sir, the, my experience in this is uh, that at the beginning we probably won't have enough capability on board in the government to, to do this robustly and that we will have to do some contracting, particularly for linguists when one's talking about social media. All social media is not in English, so we need language skills and those sorts of things which are more readily available initially in, 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 our, uh, in the private sector. But long term, uh, I think we will build a capability that mirrors our department's responsibility to review this type of data and do so with government employees that are trained and, uh, and able to do it. But my sense is the initial investment will be heavily contractor. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bond, for the record, there has been some discussion about uh, the San Bernardino individual Malik's Facebook page. In a public setting, can you kind of clarify uh, whether or not the, the presence or the lack of derogatory information was on her social media? Sir, to my knowledge, there was nothing that was publicly accessible that, uh, that indicated uh, jihadist or other threatening beliefs. I don't believe there was anything on a Facebook page or something else that one would have been able to find. Thank you. You're back, Mr. Chairman. Chair recognizes uh, Mr. Smith from Texas. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Bond, let me return to the subject of Syrian refugees. Uh, what percentage of Syrian refugees are males overall? Yeah, uh, actually, I think I, I should take that question. Okay, uh, Director Rodriguez. Then. Yeah, um, I I believe that's um, it, it is it is a minority. 
uh, uh, of the, uh, uh, the... The UN High Commissioner for Refugees says 62 percent are male. Are that... Well, it, are, are we talking about the ones that we've actually admitted to the United States, or are we talking about the overall refugee stream? Because normally what's referred to the United States uh, most okay. typically are family units. Okay. Uh, Let's go by admitted Syrian refugees. What percentage are males and what percentage are males of military age, whether they're connected to families or not? Uh, we, we can, I, don't, I don't have that specific data in front of me, but I can make it available to this committee. Okay. Well, let me tell you what I think the answer is. According to the UN High Commission on Refugees, that, that is a source for 62 percent are male. And your own data says about 25 percent are males of military age whether they're connected to families or not. Do you have any reason to believe that that's not the case? Um, the, I have no reason to believe that that's not the case. I'd like to get you the exact uh, figures based on our experience, right. uh, but I have no reason to think uh, that the, that's the not State the case. Department tries to, I think, skew the data a little bit, and they say only 2 percent are males connected to families. But if you leave off the connected to families, it suddenly uh, expands to about a quarter are, are males of military age. Um, if you don't, if you don't uh, find any problem with that, that's good. Um, let me go to Secretary Taylor for a second. Uh, Secretary Taylor, what percentage of Syrian refugees uh, are you unable to conduct any background check uh, involving third party or independent data? In other words, what percentage of Syrian refugees in effect have a clean slate except for what they themselves tell you? And by the way, I don't mean by clean slate that they're innocent of any wrongdoing. I'm just saying, what percentage are you unable to conduct any kind of a background check involving independent data? We are able to conduct a background check on 100 percent. Right. I, that's, that wasn't my question. I know you conduct background checks. I'm just saying, what percentage are you able to uh, vet that have independent third party data that you are, have access to? Sir, I'm not sure I understand. Perhaps Director Rodriguez, she would. Uh, yeah, I, I think the essence uh, of, of your question, Congressman, is uh, uh, when we query the various databases that both General Taylor and I have described, uh, what percentage uh, of those individuals don't show up on those databases at all? Right. Again, again, Meaning, a blank slate. You have no information on right. them whatsoever. What and, and I've described to you the cases where individuals are in those databases because there is derogatory information about them on those databases. And you're asking uh, what portion, happily actually a very large portion, don't have derogatory uh, information about them. I think your question no, no, is, not, yeah, my no, question, no, but, but or any, do we any have? Inf any information whatsoever, when you have no information about somebody, what percentage of Syrian refugees fall into that category? Well, we always, we generally do have information that is beyond just what that, that individual provides. In other words, we are checking also against country conditions. No, no. Uh, and we no, are, again, let me, let me go to my question and hope you'll answer it. Uh, what percentage of Syrian refugees do you have no independent <coughs> Uh, data on? A large percentage do not have derogatory information in those databases. There is other okay, documentation that, uh, uh, that they present in just about every case. Okay, I know they don't have any derogatory, but I'm saying that you're finding nothing. A large percentage you have no information about one way or the other, and you assume because you have no information that there's nothing derogatory. Is that right? We have other sources of information in order to check the veracity of the information that they're giving us in the interview okay. context. And by information, I'm not talking about general country conditions. I'm talking about on that specific individual. Are you saying that in most cases you have no third party independent data? Part, part of what, uh, no, uh, it depends on what you're calling third, uh, in other words, if, if, if it is true. Most of them will not appear in the, in the databases because they've done nothing wrong. Right. Uh, in but, those but, cases. But if we they had do done, have, you don't know for sure whether they've done something wrong or not. Is that correct? There's is, no is, way to guarantee that they don't have something in their background that would be suspicious. We can never, in, in, we, we, we can never 100 percent eliminate risk in, in anything that we do in this right. life. That, 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 that is a truth. The fact is that we do have a very intensive process to mitigate risk in this particular case. Right. But again, I think the answer to my question is that you said the great majority are individuals about whom you have no specific independent data about? We have other documentation with which to check the information that they're giving us in their interviews. That, that is really the point that I'm trying to make, sir. Yeah, and I guess I'm saying again, and I don't hear you contradicting it, yes, you, 
don't have any negative, but I'm saying you don't have any information whatsoever on a majority. No, we do, because they, the, the individuals bring extensive uh, government, often bring extensive government documentation. Uh, we interview multiple family members. We interview multiple members of communities. So there is actually a benchmark with which to test the information that they're giving us in interview. That's, that's, I think that's but, a critical But again, that's, here. that's general information. It's not necessarily about that specific individual. It is both general information and specific individual about that individual, about that individual's community, about that individual's but family it, unit. But again, you said most you have no specific information about that is negative, shall we say. That is correct. But, but again, that you don't correct. know whether there could be something else out there that is negative that you don't have access to. Certainly, if they're if okay. if 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 they're not in the uh, if the derogatory information about them is not in the databases, then then yeah, we wouldn't know it unless okay. we got Th it. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, Mr. Keating is recognized. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of you for your service uh, to our country in helping us uh, keep us safe. Uh, I did have a question, and it's really important. I think. Uh, the ranking member was going down this line of uh, concern by the committee, and that's the resource concern. And one of the things that I wanted to ask, I guess, uh, Assistant Secretary Bond or, or anyone else who could uh, answer this, is the fact that uh, we're reviewing social media now, but do we have enough linguists available uh, to do the job right now? Uh, I have a concern that resource-wise, we're not there yet. Uh, could you address that? Is that a problem uh, of resources for you? In terms of our ability to vet uh, documents, social media, other information that's in the local language or in another language, uh, for the most part, our consular officers are trained in the language of the country where they're working. And we also have uh, local employees who are, you know, fluent. In, in the language and uh, often assist uh, with interpretation and other things. If, uh, if need be, we would be able to hire additional people. In, in the case of uh, the State Department's consular work, we are fee funded and uh, we, we would be able to find the resources if we, if we needed to amp them up. Uh, in well, I, I thought we are expanding in those areas beyond the pilots. So if we are, uh, is there enough in the, in the pipeline? Uh, Let me ask the okay. colleagues from DHS to talk about the, their programs. Uh, so from the from perspective of USCIS and, for example, the social media screening, uh, as we increase the capabilities in that area, we do have uh, access uh, to language assistance contracts uh, in whatever the relevant languages uh, might be. Um, I think you understand that our funding model is fundamentally different than everybody else at this table. Uh, the work we do with respect to refugees and asylees, uh, that the resources for that are drawn from the fees that we collect from fee-paying uh, immigrants, be they naturalizing citizens, green card holders. All right, let me just rephrase it then. Do you have enough linguists? Forget about uh, your we, ability we, to get. We have, we have access to enough linguists. For the uh, expansion. In the, in, the, in the near term, we do have uh, what about enough linguists. If we're planning an expansion, which is what <laughs> I'm hearing, do you have enough that you're getting in the pipeline now for this expansion? Is what, there, or what, is it going to be a, a, a clogging of that? Pipeline? What we are building right now, yes, we do have access to enough resources. We are assessing what our long-term needs are going to be, uh, Congressman, to, to directly answer the question I know you're trying to ask. Thank you. Uh, I had a question, too. I mean, there's a difference, uh, you know, with the refugees that are coming in. They don't have the same uh, constitutional rights that an American has. So along the lines, uh, Assistant Secretary Bond, with the interview process, uh, uh, I'm curious, have you tried to incorporate technology into that process in, in terms of lie detection and other issues uh, for this? Were those things uh, implemented at all? Uh, in the interview status, in the interview process? Because we use those in our country, uh, you know, if, if there's a waiver uh, of someone's, and I was a district attorney before, uh, you know, doing investigations, and we incorporate those things here. Are they being incorporated uh, as part of your uh, vetting process? Uh, sir, if you're asking specifically about the interviews of the refugees, that, that is a program that is, uh, that again, we all keep going back to our, our friend, Mr. Rodriguez. 
but it, it is his uh, agency that does those interviews. Um, I can answer questions with respect okay, to, to visa. Mr. Rodriguez, interviews. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and, and I think your question is, do we have enough resources for that? No, it's are you incorporating uh, technological uh, devices and equipment that are pretty advanced now in terms of lie detection uh, as part of that process? Yeah, I would not uh, talk about uh, the specifics of how we use technology uh, in, in, in an open hearing, sir. Uh, I, I would be happy in a closed setting to describe what what we're doing, what we're thinking about doing, uh, but I, I would not venture into that area in this in this setting. Okay, I, I can understand the classified side. However, the person that go, I I understand it, but I think it's you're being a little broad and answering the not answering the question because the people that are going through it are going to know that it's there, so it's not going to catch people by surprise. But so, we'll go so, there. Yeah, and I'll, I mean, I'll do, do that. Do we use polygraphs in the refugee setting? The answer is no. Uh, more directly. There are other, uh, again, there are other things that I think you would want to know about that I would not uh, try to discuss here. But if your direct question is, are we using polygraphs, the answer is no. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to quickly, in a few seconds, the time frame for moving some of these pilots for uh, the social media review in these critical areas. Uh, can you give us a, just an idea, a time frame when you'll be able to expand and how much uh, in the future? Uh, right now, we are conducting uh, manual vetting. Uh, in other words, we're, we're literally just going into uh, uh, Facebook and, and Google and other uh, sources to, to identify the social media information. That's very slow going. Uh, so in the short term, we're going to be focusing, adding as quickly as we can just for the Syrians as soon as possible so we cover as much of that uh, 10,000 uh, that we're seeking to admit this year as we can. Uh, longer term, we're looking for technological solutions that will permit us to look at that more broadly. And I don't know what the timeline is going to be for actually identifying and deploying those technological uh, solutions more broadly. Well, thank you. My time is up. And uh, thank you again for your service. I think, Mr. Yeah, and if I could just uh, add to that, in our visa waiver bill, we did put um, that the department needs to look at these new technologies for uh, truth detection, if you will. Uh, Mr. Rogers from Alabama. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Taylor, back in October, we had Director Comey from the FBI here, and he was asked uh, if he could tell us with a high degree of certainty that he, through the vetting process, could assure us that ISIL would not be able to move some of their terrorist members into our country through these refugee movements. And he basically said no, that the problem was we didn't know what we don't know. And here we are four months later, and to my knowledge, we're still in that same situation. So why are you insisting that we continue to visit this topic of these 10,000 refugees? Well, sir, sir, I believe there, <clears throat> there are two questions. Uh, I'll ask Director Rodriguez to answer the question on uh, the refugee screening, which is more in his line. But I believe what Director Comey was referring to was the data that he had available within the FBI and within the intelligence community about this particular population. Uh, we know a lot more today about this population than we did when he testified back in October, and we continue to learn every day. Uh, that's our system. Uh, I wouldn't want to go specifically into how that knowledge base grows, but it grows uh, every day. Uh, it has grown since 9-11. Uh, since I welcome the opportunity to, um, in a closed session or another session, to, to speak to that uh, capacity. Uh, well, it grows because we had a lot of room for improvement. The problem is we still can't say with a high degree of certainty that they won't be able to sneak ISIL members in through those groups. And, and I've got to tell you, Mr. Rodriguez, I've been here, this is my 14th year to be honored to serve in Congress. I haven't heard an opening statement from a witness I disagreed with more than yours. I don't know why in the world you think that we should have a sense of urgency to accept these refugees, uh, moral or otherwise. The fact is the refugees who have left Syria are no longer in danger. Our moral obligation is to help make sure they have a place to stay, health care, food, until we can get them safely back into their country. Uh, we have millions of them in Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey. I can understand why you think we would want to be good Americans like we always are, very generous Americans, and help them in those areas, but why should we move them into our country? I can't understand why you think that's necessary. You know, one of the things that came up in the hearing when Director Comey was here was we had a group of refugees that had came up through some South America 
through Mexico and came to our southern border and turned themselves in and wanted asylum. Now, those people weren't in danger. They were looking for economic opportunity. And that's what I think is happening with a lot of these people. We have, and it's happening in, in Western Europe as well. Uh, these people are not, are, once they're out of Syria, they're not looking for uh, safety anymore. It's all about economic security. I had the ambassador from Romania in my office this morning, along with the member of parliament, and I asked them as they were talking about the migration issues had really upset Western Europe and Eastern Europe. And I asked him, I said, well, y'all had a, a problem with refugees in Romania? He started laughing. He said, we're way too poor. The only re refugees that have come to Romania were there by accident. And once they realized they were in Romania, they left and went to Germany or someplace with economic opportunities. So tell me why we're focused on this instead of removing Bashar al-Assad from power so these people can go back home. Why are we not working on helping the refugees stay in their neighborhood in encampments or in cities and bringing them to our country where, they, where we know ISIL intends to use them to kill us? So I think an important starting point for this discussion is the fact that since September 11th, we have admitted 785,000 refugees. Uh, 128,000 of those have come from Iraq. A number of them have come from other places uh, where there is, in fact, an active terrorist threat, uh, Somalia, other parts of, uh, of uh, North Africa. Not a single one of them uh, has actually ever engaged in uh, an active attack on the homeland. There have been plots. Uh, that have been disrupted by uh, U.S. law enforcement. And what percentage uh, of that number has happened in the last few months since Paris and since uh, we've had the problem, in the attempted attack in Berlin or the attack in San Bernardino? You're conflating this into a completely different picture. The world has changed dramatically over the last several months, and you know that. We now have to be focused on where ISIL is and the efforts they're using to get people in this country now. I agree. We're a country of immigrants. We've had a, a great, rich history with immigrants. But we have a new dynamic right now, and that, that is not relevant. What you're describing is well, not relevant I, to this I, dynamic. I guess, Congressman, where you and I do actually disagree, and I, and I appreciate your highlighting the disagreement, is I do not believe that refugee admission is purely a moral and humanitarian undertaking. It is that, uh, but it is much, uh, much, much more. It has a critical, strategic national security and foreign policy role. If we are not seen as offering opportunity, uh, to the very victims of ISIL and al-Nusra, uh, then we will have, we will have given uh, away a vital part of the battlefield. Why do we, we owe have them opportunity? I'm sorry? Why do we owe them opportunity? Be because right now those individuals uh, are, are displaced. Uh, they may be safe over the short term. There are 400,000 children uh, who are not and going And we can to provide school. them opportunity for safety in their neighborhood, in Turkey, in Jordan, in those areas. We don't have to have them in our country to make sure they stay safe, well-fed, and cared for. And that is certainly one reason why uh, the numbers that we are taking are relatively small compared to the overall number who are in refugee status. And it is something that we are doing alongside uh, the other English-speaking countries that have made commitments to accept refugees, the other European countries that have uh, made commitments. Uh, that's also a critical. We need to work with our allies uh, to deal uh, with this problem together. We cannot uh, place ourselves in a pro uh, posture uh, where we're saying it is their problem and not, our and not ours. Uh, that, that, in my mind, actually does have a national security implication if, if we do not uh, look at it that way. But I, but I understand that is a point on which you and I disagree, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chair recognizes Mr. Longevin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I uh, want to thank the panel. Uh, for your testimony today and the work you're doing to protect the, the American people. Um, General Taylor, uh, Secretary Bond, uh, you have both uh, highlighted some processes uh, that, uh, that the Federal Government uh, is implementing uh, or has already implemented to tighten screening of, uh, of visa applicants and, uh, or, and refugees. And I think we can all agree that this is, a, uh, uh, this is, is vital to ensure that uh, security re reviews are as thorough uh, as possible and thorough enough to flag any applicant uh, with derogatory information in government databases. However, uh, I remain concerned about applicants uh, for whom there is no U.S. source uh, intelligence, but uh, for whom there may be intelligence from our partners. Uh, do you share these concerns? Uh, what barriers uh, remain to uh, free flow of information between uh, counterterrorism uh, agencies here and those abroad, particularly? in Europe, which I know have uh, stricter or different privacy laws that, uh, that we have that may restrict 
that information sharing. And we've had testimony, uh, both in classified and open sessions, uh, expressing that that concern. Uh, but what can we do to uh, to remove them? Uh, Congressman, thank you very much for that very pertinent question. And I think uh, I would start out with the legislation that recently passed in December, which has strengthened the visa waiver program to include uh, the HSPD-6 requirements for information sharing, uh, which um, not all countries in visa waiver were um, uh, had an HSPD-6 agreement uh, with, uh, with the United States. Uh, by the end of this year, all countries will have that agreement, and I think that strengthens the intelligence and law enforcement exchange that uh, is so vital to this global problem. Um, the one thing that uh, has been crystal clear to me is that terrorists do not honor borders. They do not honor law enforcement. They move uh, as anywhere that they believe they can move with uh, impunity. And the way in which information sharing allows uh, our governments and our allies uh, to be more effective in spotting those movements. And so that exchange is rich, it's continuing, and our, I sense a new sense of uh, urgency in our partners, particularly in Europe, to collect the data that uh, is necessary to protect their country and in collecting the, that their countries, collecting that data, make that data available to U.S. authorities on a reciprocal basis. So uh, under the, the agreements that you're saying are going to be in place by the end of the year, that you're, you're confident that that takes care of all the problems, that there, there would be no oh, barriers no, to information sharing on the European side, that they need to change their laws in any way to accommodate more robust intelligence sharing? All I can say is we've made it very clear to our partners in the Visa Waiver Program that a necessary uh, ingredient in that uh, uh, agreement for visa waiver is that we have an information sharing agreement and that uh, we're insisting on it. Uh, that begins a process. It's not an end game, but you know, these relationships grow over time. Uh, but the framework for those relationships will be in place with all of the countries that uh, we currently uh, have visa waiver agreements with. Okay. Thank you. Um, Secretary Taylor, in your testimony, you state that the Department recognizes that technological advances and the evolving nature of the threat environment require you to continuously reevaluate and improve our screening and vetting process. Uh, can you further elaborate on how you're um, evaluating uh, and uh, how you could enhance the way the Department elicits information from applicants, identifying new kinds of data uh, that might be valuable, and uh, developing new methods? Uh, to uh, efficient, uh, efficiently uh, incorporate this data into the department systems? Well, I, I would answer that in two ways. First, uh, this committee has been very supportive of the initiative of the Secretary to create a DHS data framework and for that framework to be uh, effective in sharing data across all of our components as opposed to just in individual components, which is a big step towards how we organize ourselves uh, to use information that may be available in one component that's not available in another. So that's the first step. The second step uh, is these issues are becoming much more complicated. Uh, and in many cases, components will solve their, their uh, initial issue that they want to do with social media, but not solve a more broader issue. So what we've, our task force is designed to create really a center of excellence. For, for vetting uh, in the department where we are continually striving to look for new techniques, tools, processes uh, that help us get better at this, not at a suboptimal level in our components, but as a department. And that's our goal going forward. Good. Yeah, I think it's essential to be, uh, to be nimble and to recognize this technology, especially changes so rapidly that we're doing everything we can to incorporate those new capabilities into our vetting system too. That's our, that's the Secretary's direction and we're moving with all deliberate speed. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Mr. Duncan from South Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, I want to refute one thing that uh, Mr. Rodriguez just said. You know, there hadn't been an act of terror. I won't refute it, but 
I want to applaud law enforcement for actually stopping the acts of terror that could have been committed by refugees that have been granted refugee status in this country. January 7th, Texas and California, prime examples of Iraqi refugees granted refugee status in this country, 2006, 2009, whatever the year was, law enforcement got, got it right. They actually stopped it. I applaud them for that. I thank you men for your service, but the, the glaring example that I just mentioned shows that if you don't vet refugees coming in this country, the potential, the possibility of an act of terror happening on U.S. soil from someone that comes from Iraq or Syria is real. The, um, last week, back in the district, I had an opportunity to testify before the South Carolina State Senate. Possibly the first time a United States Congressman has ever testified in the General Assembly of South Carolina. Myself and Congressman Mick Mulvaney on the Syrian refugee issue. South Carolina does not want unvetted Syrian refugees to locate in their state. But yet the Obama administration continues to try to um, make that happen. Since uh, the Syrian civil war broke out, the numbers I have are 2,693 Syrian refugees have been admitted into this country. For the record, 53 of those were Christian. 33 were non-Muslim. The remaining of those were Muslim. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record my testimony in South Carolina Senate last week. Without objection, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> in 2000 and 11 or 12, Mr. Chairman, you and I traveled to Afghanistan. And there at a Ford operating base, we met a gentleman that was assisting the United States military as a translator. His name was Hollywood. After we left, we were contacted by a former member of Congress, Charles DeJou from Hawaii, who served with that unit at that Ford operating base, knew Hollywood well saw him want to pick up a gun and fight the Taliban, who was threatened by the Taliban for being an interpreter for this country. Charles DeJou asked us, former Congressman DeJou asked us to assist Hollywood with coming into this country under the um, asylum program for interpreters that helped our country. It took over two years for this gentleman who was verified by the general of the 3rd Army um, 10th Mountain Division who was verified by the unit that he assisted, who had members of Congress writing letters for him, who had General Petraeus, for goodness sakes, had met the gentleman and vouched for him. Took two years to get that gentleman here under that program. We scrutinized his background. But we're going to allow unvetted Syrian refugees from an area that ISIS who has declared war on the United States, whether we've declared war on them or not, has said they will infiltrate that refugee program and also exploit the migration program in Europe, and that's a whole other topic of foreign fighter flow, of visa waiver program, of Schengen, of the ability for someone who has a long-term vision to get into Europe and eventually come into this country under those programs. But we're going to allow unvetted Syrian refugees into this country. These policies of the Obama administration put Americans at risk because we don't know who's coming into this country by allowing unvetted Syrian refugees. You guys can say we're doing the best job we can, we are vetting, but Director Comey refutes that. He said, we're trying to do better, we've got it on testimony, but we're not very good at it. We can't tell you that we vetted these folks because the information isn't available. The records have been destroyed, they've been stolen. You, someone from Syria can travel into Turkey and for $600 buy a new identity, a new passport. So, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate us continuing to raise awareness of this issue with Syrian refugees. I'm amazed that an administration that wants to expand background checks for law-abiding American citizens exercising their Second Amendment constitutional rights will refuse to do the background checks necessary on possibly uh, Syrian refugees. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back. Thank the uh, gentleman. The chair recognizes Ms. Torres from California. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to begin by um, asking 
I would like to, uh, to ask unanimously, unanimous consent for statements from a coalition of faith-based and advocacy groups to be entered uh, into the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank you. Um, so, um, Mr. Rodriguez, um, uh, Mr. Taylor, thank you so much uh, for um, the briefing that we received uh, yesterday. Um, making yourselves available um, to us um, to brief us in a classify uh, vetting. So I, I want to make sure that I, I understand this process. Um, as you know, I have been very involved in um, the refugees that were placed in my home city. I had meetings with them and about the interview process and asked them directly from their perspective as to what was their experience. Um, two families, uh, very young children, and one um, has a male that was, I think, 15 or 16 years old when they started the process. He's 19 now, 1920 now. Now, social media uh, for a three-year-old, obviously that three-year-old, unless it's an American three-year-old, like my one-year-old grandson, may not have a social media um, account, may not have a social media presence, right? So when we ask you to check all 10,000 of those through a social media um, process, that could be impossible. Is that, can you explain that process uh, to me? I don't think it would be impossible. There may not be a social media presence right. for all 10,000 of those individuals, but the capacity to determine that is something that's certainly within <coughs> where we're trying to drive towards right. uh, for the future. So the male, the young male, explained to me that um, for every one um, appointment, interview appointment that the family um, had, he had two or three additional appointments. Um, cell phone records, uh, phone books, um, any information that he could provide um, to, um, to the department was asked at ver in very different um, uh, meetings to ensure that he was telling the truth or to verify that he wasn't giving different types of statements. Um, Mr. Rodriguez, that interagency check uh, that you were beginning to explain earlier. Can you provide a little bit more detail, sure. uh, information on that? Sure, and, and I think the, uh, the example you're citing, and I'm, and, and I'm assuming that that was a refugee interview overseas, but it may have been some subsequent activity here in the United States. No, it was overseas. Um, it illustrates the point that I was trying to make to Congressman Smith, which is we don't just hear what the person has to say. Where, where there are reasons to, we go beyond and look for documentation uh, that either helps us explore issues that may exist or help us corroborate uh, information that is presented uh, in the testimony. Uh, speaking uh, specifically about the uh, interagency check, uh, and, and I'm not uh, at liberty in an open setting to talk about everything that sort of sits behind that check, everything that is queried as part of that check, uh, but the point of the interagency check is, is it gives us a one-stop place uh, to uh, access uh, all intelligence holdings, all law enforcement holdings uh, that uh, could carry, and in fact in some cases have carried, uh, derogatory information uh, about an individual. So that, that's basic. Lot, I don't have a whole lot of time. I do want to ask you, um, is it in the best interest of the U.S. to have a robust um, uh, process there overseas rather than um, closing that process that would possibly encourage more um, Syrian refugees to take on um, a path to come through um, our southern border and present themselves knowing that once they're here, they're here and we have to deal with them at our border. I, I think that's, that's one of, uh, another critical point, which is we can either uh, have uh, an orderly uh, internationally based system of migration where we're working together uh, with our allies and, and create an actual opportunity for permanent resettlement 
uh, or we can have hundreds of thousands and millions of people who are displaced uh, without any prospect of immediate settlement, meaning their kids don't go to school, they don't have any kind of economic security, that will have consequences for the entire world if we allow that to happen. Thank you. Uh, my time has expired, and I yield back. Mr. Bartoletta from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Director Rodriguez, my, my constituents uh, in Pennsylvania are worried about their safety when they hear that the refugees are coming into the Commonwealth uh, because they simply don't trust the vetting process. And, and to be on, honest with you, I, I have a lot of concerns, too. And here, here's why. Here in this committee, According to former FBI Assistant Director Tom Fuentes, our, our human, and this is his quote, our human resources in Syria are minimal, and we don't have a government we can partner with, and that's a key thing. Two, National Counterterrorism -Ter Center Director Nicholas Rasmussen explained that the intelligence picture that we've had of this Syrian conflict zone isn't what we'd like it to be. You can only review data which, which you have. Three. FBI Assistant Director Michael Steinbach said that the concern in Syria is that we don't have the systems in place on the ground to collect the information. All of the data sets, the police, the intel services that normally you would go and seek that information from don't exist. And four, FBI Director James Comey said, we can query our da databases until the cows come home, but nothing will show up because we have no record of that person. We can only query what, we, what you have collected. My question to you is, can you confirm to us today that not one single refugee who doesn't show up on our databases is admitted into the United States? I think that's the point that I was, if, if you don't show up on the databases, it means there isn't derogatory information. It means we don't have... Uh, well, that's not true. Not, 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 I, I don't think anybody here believes that. I don't think it's we have no database to check doesn't mean that, that, that there is no history. We have no records or we cannot count on the Syrian government to, to give us that database. So that doesn't mean that nothing we, exists. It means that we just don't have any database to collect that information. I don't think anybody here believes that. Well, I, I think one of the key parts that I've been trying to and emphasize this is why this is why the American people don't trust us allowing people in here because they don't think we're getting a straight story. I think I, if, if, if I had a couple moments to describe the entire process, uh, which is a lengthy process. That no, my, but I, I'd like you to and, answer my question first. Can you confirm today that not one single refugee from Syria will be admitted into the Uni United States if they don't show up on a database? Can you confirm today that not one person will be allowed in? Uh, if, if they don't, if, if there, there are people who have been admitted who haven't shown up on databases. Okay. That doesn't mean we don't take other steps. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean that, that there that are other things we do to satisfy ourselves that the person we are admitting uh, does not uh, uh, pose a threat. So I, I think you need to hear how the whole process works uh, before focusing on one element of the process. As See, it only takes one person. Doesn't doesn't take an army. Your family, my family, every single person in your family, that family is the most important people in the world to you. It only takes one person. I don't think we should allow one single refugee into the United States if we cannot confirm factually that we have checked the database and, and we can confirm that that person does not possess a, an intent or a threat to the, to the American people. I, I, want, I want to go on it because I, I got the answer I wanted there. Um, you know, I've been saying since I've been in, been in Congress that, that, and I know sometimes I sound like a broken record, uh, the 9-11 Commission report taught us many times that, that the, the best weapon that terrorists have is a ballot travel document uh, because terrorists want two things. They want to get into the country uh, and then they want to stay here just long enough uh, to, to carry out uh, the, their mission and, and more than 40 percent of of illegal immigrants that are present in this country came here legally and they have their, their visa expire and then they, they never left and we can't find them. You know, if your state is home to an international airport, I believe you're a, a border state. Uh, of approximately 400 individuals who have been convicted in the United States as a result of international terrorism related investigations conducted from September 2001 through March 2010, approximately 36 were visa overstays. Uh, I don't believe there's a, there's a strong enough deterrent to, 
for anyone who wants to overstay their, their visa. And that's one reason I introduced the, uh, a bill, a visa overstay, which, which brings the visa overstay laws in line with current law for crossing a border unlawfully, makes them parallel, making it a crime to overstay your visa, and it is more of a deterrent. Uh, Under Secretary Taylor, would, would you agree that tougher penalties and clarity in the law will, will help agents perform their jobs? And, and do you think we need to have a tougher deterrent than, we, than exists right now uh, for those who are thinking of overstaying their visa? Sir, at this point, what I would say uh, is that the Department, uh, for the first time in history, uh, produced a visa overstay report that had been asked for from this Congress for many years. This is an area of great concern to our Secretary, and he's directed uh, CBP and ICE to work on potential solutions that would uh, deter individuals from um, wanting to overstay uh, their invitation to our country. I'm not in a position today to tell you what that's going to look like, but I know that uh, that direction has been given, and I'm sure the Secretary will be happy to uh, address that issue once he's had a chance to have his team consult on it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Perry from Pennsylvania. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen, lady, thank you very much for your time here today. Mr. Rodriguez, can you tell us the last time you read the national security strategy? I'm not sure I've, I have read the national security strategy. I'll, I'll acknowledge that. Okay. So I'm looking at your, at your resume here, what's provided to us, and I'm assuming it's correct. It goes back to 1997. I see that you spent some time in Pennsylvania. But I don't see any foreign, any service in, in, uh, uh, in, in foreign countries or with the State Department or whatever. And the reason I bring this up is I listened to your opening statement. I found it breathtaking that you lecture and suggest to the United States Congress, the representative of the people, that this refugee program is a vital part of foreign policy and national security. And while I appreciate your opinion in that, that is wholly out of your purview, sir. Your job as director is to carry out the policies therein prescribed. And so while you're trying to impose a narrative on, on America through its representatives and make us somehow feel bad that we don't agree with you, I just want to say for the record, you seem completely out of your lane in that regard. With that, I'm looking at privacy policy for operational use of social media. Are you familiar, sir? Yes, sir. Okay. So if I go to D, rules of behavior, number five, it says respect the individual's privacy settings and access only information that is publicly available unless the individual whose information the employee seeks to access has given consent to access it. Can you tell us how this policy enhances to the fullest extent capable the security and safety of the United States? Uh, that, that is a generalized uh, social media uh, use policy that you're talking about. Uh, in fact, uh, we are, as part of the work that we're, uh, when we are uh, querying social media, uh, we are querying uh, without the active consent of the individual. Uh, we are extensively querying uh, the social media uh, uh, accounts. So is this policy going to change? Well, it, it, this is, this is the, the uh, sort of the, the ordinary baseline uh, that you're looking at. In fact, But we shouldn't are the ordinary baseline, even considering Mr. Barletta's questioning regarding databases and information that we don't have where we're relying on many systems, but arguably on the fidelity of the individual themselves, Shouldn't the policy, shouldn't the default setting be that we're going to check everything and we'll make exceptions when we don't need to check everything? Because it seems to me the default setting is we give all these people the benefit of the doubt unless we find something derogatory. I, I think there's a, there's a more significant uh, practical issue here, which is all we can access, all we have the, the technological tool to access uh, is the, the public-facing statements uh, that, that individuals make. Uh, we, we, we do not have uh, a way to reach private communities. And, and we, uh, we understand that, but the policy says, as a matter of fact, if I go further into this policy, which is Privacy Policy Guidance Memorandum, January 19, 2007, I'm assuming you're familiar, right? It says here 
that it is under this policy DHS components will handle non-U.S. persons information held in mixed systems in accordance with the fair information practices as set forth in the Privacy Act, thereby giving people that wish to come to this country that we know little about the same rights as every American citizen. Yeah. I, th that's one document uh, among a series of policies that govern what we're doing. So which and policy I, countervails this? Well, uh, we can certainly uh, walk you through that. It's, it's an extensive you, you set of both. What? Well, it's basically an extensive set of both policies and practices that we have uh, that, it were, that have been issued in particular in the last year, which give us proactive authorization uh, to look at uh, social media accounts as part of our, our security vetting for people we're admitting. But is that the default setting, or is that the exception based on this policy? I guess what, I, what I'm telling you is what we're doing, which I think is the most important thing. I, I, we, can, we can parse what the policies say. What we are doing is we are looking, uh, when we are looking at social media, we are looking at it. Uh, so you just said, hold on a second, when we are looking at social media. So I picture myself, not as you, you are the director. I'm one of the folks out in the field looking at policy statements that this is my job and it says, well, I have to treat all these people that I don't know anything about, don't know the culture, don't know the language, could be a terrorist like every American citizen. Unless I, do I call you and yeah. say, hey, I'm not that's, sure about this one. But that's not what we're doing. What, what, what I am telling so, you is we are looking with, lang with appropriate linguistic support. Uh, we are looking uh, at these accounts right now without necessarily seeking the specific uh, consent of the individuals. Congressman, if I might uh, follow yes, on from the Director. Um, this policy was written in 2012. Correct. Uh, it was promulgated by our privacy office, was not promulgated as a part of a broader DHS strategy for the use of social media uh, in our, in our um, operations across the Department. One of the um, responsibilities the Secretary has given to my task force is to rewrite our policy to bring it up to current standards to make it. When can we expect that? And what is the interim guidance, if you don't mind, Mr. Chairman? What is the interim guidance? What do agents in the field at this time, what is their guidance? And agents when can we expect to change today this? They have 33 clear policy pronouncements, and I can get those for you. Uh, by their components that outline their day-to-day -day use of, uh, of, um, of social media. <laughs> My intent is to have a policy before the Secretary within the next month. It's on my, my shopping list of things that I got to get done. Uh, but this policy was written in 2012 as a baseline for how the Department would use social media. Uh, certainly the environment and the technology has changed significantly yes. since that policy was written, and that's why the Secretary wants a comprehensive I would I look forward to that information. Yes, sir. Coming. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Katko from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we've had a robust discussion about the things you are doing to uh, uh, enhance the, uh, the vetting process for refugees and for uh, uh, people coming in this country in general. I, I want to flip it on ahead a bit and talk about what we should be doing, because uh, I think in this instance especially, when it matters to national security, we need to strive for perfection at all times. And that's why, General, I was very heartened by your comments when you said that uh, you're constantly rechecking re re the processes, how we can get better, because that's exactly the attitude we need to have. So I, I just have one pointed question for you, and then I've, I've got a secondary question that's more general. And the question for you is, in enhancing the vetting process for uh, 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 mining the public access to the Internet, um, do you, how much input are you getting from the private sector? And I ask that because in my role as uh, uh, chairman of the Subcommittee on Transportation Security, it's become apparent to me that Homeland Security in general, and TSA in particular, do not do a good job, a good enough job, of uh, looking at what's going on in the private sector. Necessity is the mother of invention. There's a lot of good ideas out there, and I think sometimes Homeland Security's procurement process is somewhat insular, and it's preventing you from getting the ideas that are out there. And I'll give you one example. There are public companies that do a terrific job with creating algorithms that they use in the private sector to mine the public access, uh, public sources over the internet to vet people. And we're not doing that on, in, on the Homeland Security level, and I think we need to. So with that, I'll just ask you a question. Well, thank you very much for the question, sir. It's uh, really a part of the charter I've been given by the Secretary and our task force, not only to look at best in class within our department and within the government, but best in class 
uh, in the private sector. To that end, uh, we've announced an industry day at the end of February where we're going to invite folks from across the private sector to come in and tell us what's, what they're doing, how they're doing, and how that might help us with the mission that we've set forth. So we recognize, uh, as you know, I came back to government from the private sector where there's a lot of innovation, and we should exploit that innovation as we move forward in this effort, and that will be a big part of what we do. Well, I applaud that, and I, I would like to hear, uh, at, have you report back to us what you're doing in that regard, because that is a, somewhat of a sea change from how they viewed it in the past, and you know, sticking with the same vendors and the same old uh, ideas you're comfortable with are not how we're going to solve this problem or get better at this. It's not innovation. So uh, we'll be happy to come back uh, right. as the task force develops. I appreciate it. By the way, I, I take it all full, four of you agree that mining the, pu the public uh, sources of the Internet is uh, wholly appropriate when trying to keep our country safe. Is that correct? I think you all, all agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll just note for the record, everyone's nodding their head, and, that's, that, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Now, uh, with respect to uh, switching gears a bit, We've talked a lot about the Kentucky incident where Iraqi individuals slipped through the cracks and um, then plotted some, some terrorism activity here in the United States before they, before they were uh, caught and arrested and convicted. And obviously um, that's of huge concern. Then we also heard about, uh, not so much in refugee process, but a more recent case of Tashfeen Malik where we just didn't find out how radicalized she was before she got here. Um, so obviously there's gaps, there's problems. So instead of telling us what you've done, tell me what you've learned from those two cases. And I just throw it out to anybody. What you've learned from those two cases that you can do better, because in both those cases we missed, missed them, and one was particularly refugee process, a Kentucky case. Uh, Tashfi Malik was a, a visa case, and uh, in both cases we missed it. Now, there's not, I'm not criticizing, I just tell me what we can do to make it better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I um and I, I think it's been clear uh, from the members of the committee, um, everyone that sits at this table understands uh, personally and professionally the challenge that we face in terms of protecting this country from folks that would do her harm. And our process is very clear. Every failure becomes an opportunity to learn. Every failure becomes mm -hmm. an opportunity to develop new tactics, techniques, and procedures, and to go back and examine it, just as we did in the private sector when we had failures, we go back and we take a look and, and improve. And every day the system is evolving, every day, because everyone in this business today understands that the American standard is, uh, it only takes one. And we don't want that one to happen, unfortunately a couple have. Uh, but our process is not to say we got it. The process is to critically examine what we do, why we did it,